Well, welcome everyone to the uh, uh, next uh, webinar in our Arts and Humanities series, Humanities and Arts East and West today. And we've got two outstanding speakers uh, on the topic. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to introduce two wonderful colleagues and good friends uh, in Yang Rui and Marak van der Wende. Um, I think our first speaker will be Marak, is that correct? Yeah, Mark is a distinguished professor of higher education at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She has a, a remarkable history as a scholar. Um, she's played a central role in many discussions and debates in relation to internationalization and globalization in the last 25 years. Her work's been very influential and important. Yang Rui is the Dean of Education in the Faculty of Education at the University of Hong Kong, one of the most important centers in the world for comparative and international education and a, a remarkable school in terms of the quality of its work in all domains. Um, he's not been Dean for very long, um, but he's had a long academic career in um, China, uh, Australia and Hong Kong. Uh, and he's particularly focused on the interface between the Western tradition in higher education and the Chinese tradition done a lot of empirical work in China and his work in both English and Chinese has been very influential and important to, to many of us. So we look forward to, to both of you. And at this point, um, Marak, I think the screen is yours. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Rui, for sharing the, uh, the talk with uh, me today. Um, let me see. I'm speaking um, from a background as the, as the founding dean of Amsterdam University College, and that's a liberal arts and science college established jointly by the University of Amsterdam and the Free University of Amsterdam in 2009, and I was its dean until 2015. And there was so, Rui, there is a period beyond deanship. <laughs> It's a good one. Um, in preparing for AUC, I examined the history of liberal arts and sciences in the US and, and in Europe. And during my deanship, I published various pieces trying to analyze the re-emergence basically of liberal arts and it's also its new meaning in the 21st century in, um, in higher education. And I'm currently reflecting on that experience um, and my color, former scholarly work in this area um, in drafting an essay for a special issue uh, for Daedalus, the, the Journal of the American Academy, on advances and challenges in international higher education under the uh, editorship of um, Howard Gardner and William Kirby. So the re-emergence of liberal arts and science uh, in European higher education that emerged in the 1990s um, was seen as an innovation. And the fact that it was in a way also a, a return to the classical approach of the curriculum in medieval universities was at that point overstemmed by the idea that it was a modern US model of undergraduate education that could very well fit in the, yeah, what I would say increasingly utilitarian context is driven by the notions then of knowledge economy and, and global competitiveness. So liberal arts was um, reintroduced as it was seen to contribute to, to the concurrent aims and expectations of the time, internationalization, interdisciplinarity, development of 21st century skills, excellence, more selectivity, differentiation at system level. But Beyond these innovative and or more or less utilitarian features, how was the liberal aspect actually considered and perceived then? And what about the local, national, global dimensions of the expected responsible citizenship as an outcome? In, in my earlier work on, in this area, I analyzed the, the drivers for liberal arts education in the 21st century by distinguishing three arguments in, in favor of this, uh, this type of undergraduate education in the 21st century. The first one, um, an epistemological argument um, related to development of knowledge, most exciting 
science happening at the interface of traditional disciplines, big challenges in science and society, not solvable by single disciplinary approaches, hence interdisciplinarity had to find its place in undergraduate curricula. Second argument of a very economic nature, I think, related to the employability of graduates. And that is where these so-called 21st century skills um, came in to enable graduates to be creative, critical thinkers, problem solvers, uh, intercultural, multi-language communication, et cetera. And the third category of arguments related to the moral and social dimension and the deeply humanistic tradition of liberal arts and underlines the importance of educating the whole person, including personal and intellectual development with a view to social responsibility and citizenship. Democratic citizenship, I'll come back to that. These arguments, these three arguments are not necessarily mutually exclusive and to some extent interrelated, they're not radically new. But I think the first two have been strongly driven by the developments of global knowledge economy into a converging agenda for undergraduate education in the 21st century. The third type of argument is this social moral dimension, the humanistic tradition is more complex to redefine in this new global century because it does not seem to be characterized by convergence, by divergence rather in the political and ideological context and sense. And we realize that in democratic societies, it's taken for granted that citizenship implies democratic citizenship. But this may be less obvious in certain other countries and contexts. So questions about the scope of citizenship are important here. Should it be understood as national citizenship for nation building, patriotic even, regional, for instance, European citizenship, global, cosmopolitan citizenship? Moreover, and as noted by Marta Nussbaum in her book, Not for Profit, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities, 2010, she says tensions may arise between economic and social moral arguments. On the other hand, she says an increasingly utilitarian emphasis in education may be to the detriment of the humanistic traditions and values. Nussbaum. And she also was among the Western scholars that argued that shaping citizens to higher education means that they must be prepared for a culturally diverse and international world, which requires understanding of the pr perspectives of a wide variety of cultures. Nussbaum noted in 2010, quite optimistically, I think, that, I quote, this is more now the case as young people rarely leave college as ignorant about the non-Western world as students did some decades ago. And she also stated that universities in many nations outside the US were striving to build a liberal arts component, acknowledging the importance of liberal arts in crafting a public response, as she phrased it, to the problems of the problems of pluralism, fear, and suspicion their societies face. Indeed, and as European university, American universities such as in Beirut, Cairo, Eastern Europe, Hungary, Central Asia, Kazakhstan, had strong liberal missions in areas where they saw that national animosities remained and cross-cultural incomprehensions persisted. And thus, preparation for what they labeled as cosmopolitan citizenship should be a purpose of liberal arts education in the 21st century. Such initiatives, such US initiatives also spread into Asia, Yale and US in Singapore, NYU in Shanghai, etc. However, the question whether it can actually be taken for granted that citizenship implies democratic citizenship turned out to be more relevant than we thought at the time of writing. 
and whether liberal values can be seen as global values indeed. The question was broadened in my work with William Kirby in our book on liberal arts, A Dialogue Across the Continents, 2016, to ask whether a liberal education can actually exist in an illiberal context at all. Yeah, further reflection is required on the seemingly ongoing developments in Europe and beyond since. Because as much as they were, as these liberal values and, and democratic and European and global citizenship were, I think, too easily taken for granted in the early 2000s, the more they became under attack in the next decades. Liberal education became a, tech, a target of illiberal regimes. CEU was banned from Hungary, Smolny in St. Petersburg, uh, Smolny College and St. Petersburg universities was deemed by Russia an undesirable organization and closed. In such context, liberal education is not seen to be feeding into the desired patriotic citizenship. And that term remembered, reminded me of a seminar around 2015 on liberal arts and science education in St. Petersburg's Boris Yeltsin Library. I was among the speakers. And when the Russian panel with the rectors of Moscow and St. Petersburg State discussed the liberal arts education purpose, they phrased patriotic citizenship as an important aim. It struck me. I never forgot the term and found the mission, I quote, to instill patriotism in young people. And of quote, back in the recent statement published by Russian rectors backing up Putin's invasion in Ukraine, uh, published last March. So these recent trends seem to be part of illiberal reactions to higher education, which are observed more widely in Europe and globally. Yale and US was discontinued. They're associated with growing populism, neo-nationalism, a threat to academic freedom. But the liberal trends may also come from within higher education. For instance, associated with wokeness and cancel culture. And paradoxically, perhaps, some liberal arts colleges in Europe are considered hotspots of such illiberalism from within. Hence the challenge for liberal arts and science education to, to reconsider its mission and model in this new reality. Their continued and liberal mission has to be to support students in finding nuance, intellectual humility, understanding the validity of other perspectives, overcoming value judgments, nationalist lenses, to develop empathy and approaching big questions. And ethical issues from different perspectives. Rui Yang will talk about Chinese cultural and academic traditions and make a plea for intellectual pluralism, a concept I think that would fit this idea. So liberal arts has to contribute in its specific way to this formidable task of Western higher education to ensure that future generations are sufficiently aware of the virtues and values of an open and democratic society and ready to support and sustain these in a global reality, but in which, however, Western universalism and liberalism as such are being challenged. A truly essential educational mission, but not an easy one. And I think one should consider the strength and weaknesses of the humanities in this respect. Of course, I'm quoting Collini, humanities are always in crisis. And we talk about marginalization of the humanities. And we have to acknowledge, especially the humanities are object of renationalization or even re-regionalization at the development, at the detriment of development of, for instance, global history. Multiple examples of rewriting history in nationalistic perspectives can be given. Look, for instance, at Tim Timothy Snyder's critique on the rewriting of Russia's history in the Ukraine crisis. Humanities are a focal point also of discussions on decolonizing the curriculum, necessary, unavoidable, 
that can be extremely deep and difficult in especially post-colonial powers, as many European countries are. Humanities are internally fragmented, perhaps traditionally so, but recently even more so, I think, as related to diversity issues, identity politics, wokeness, cancel, can, cancel culture extends into self-censorship, internal cultural wars, and, and actual dismissal, dismissal of academics. So intellectual pluralism, yes, but not to confuse, be confused with intellectual or methodological or knowledge relativism. Truth in universe, trust in universities requires research integrity. And experts in this field conclude that value pluralism is inherent even to the codes of conduct and research integrity and application have quotes needs careful reasoning and judgment together with, they say, intellectually humble attitude that acknowledges the inevit inevitability of value pluralism. It's a thin line. It's a thin line because at the same time, humanities are under heavy external critique as suffering from methodological and knowledge relativism. Postmodernism is blamed for contributing to post-truth world constructivist and discourse power perspectives for undermining global universal meanings of science, framing it as a Western or male construct, et cetera, et cetera. Academia, in the sense, is even blamed for the demise of liberalism. So it's difficult to see where radicalized postmodernism or, or new orientations such as post-humanism post are taking us. And Humanism, humanities in this way may drift, may re run the risk to drift further and further away of the sciences, in spite of C.P. Snow's argument on the essential connection between the two cultures. He said, C.P. Snow said in 1961 about it, I quote, the ever increasing gap between the humanities and the sciences is an obstacle to serving the world's greatest problems. We are increasingly dependent on and driven by science and technology. The silent forces of history and ignorance of the working and ideas of science is dangerous." End of quote. This is why AUC was deliberately set up as a liberal arts and science college. So for the humanities, despite their internal fragmentation and their external challenges as a, as a whole, and to remain relevant, I believe, they need to remain, defend or regain a global and inclusive rather than fragmented orientation and remain connected to the world of science, discovery and technology. I believe Snow's words are not outdated. The human and the scientific and technological worlds are not and should not be disconnected. So let's see see what the digital humanities have brought us. And let's wait, not too long, and see what AI is further up to. We're all users of it, and we need the humanities to understand it. And finally, chat GPT is there, and it can write your next essay on the topic. Thank you. Well, thanks, Mark. That's a tremendously insightful presentation. and. Um... I think we pass quickly now to Rui, and then we'll go to the questions and answer session. So, Rui. Thank you, Simon. And uh, let me share. I use a few slides. Let me share a screen. Uh, I we can see that. Yeah, OK. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Sam. And also, thank your colleagues at the centre. Uh, it's lovely to see uh, Marek and many other colleagues and friends here. I see uh, many lovely friends. Uh, Ruth is there. Um, this is uh, Chinese New Year period. So happy if you are Chinese, happy Chinese New Year, the year of rabbit. Um, <clears throat> I, I just want to echo very much um, what Marek just, say, just said. I think it was extremely well said. Um, anchoring her, I want to provide more 
country experience, um, of the Chinese experience, to show um, the, the arts and the humanities are at the central place of higher education today. It is important, it is extremely important at its individual level and also at a system, systemic level. Um, I want to use the Chinese experience, but the Chinese experience has, I think the experience is extremely important and uh, even enlightening, but not necessarily successful or pleasant uh, um, experience. So uh, let me uh, go to uh, using my slides. I usually um, talk to my students by asking questions at the very beginning. Sounds very ridiculous questions, um, but these questions are often taken for granted. You know, are Chinese people Chinese enough? Are contemporary Chinese people Chinese? Or contemporary Chinese people Chinese enough? Or uh, as Chinese people, are we, are they feeling settled and happy? And do you, as Chinese people, do you think we know how to be Chinese in the present day? I don't think these are easy questions. I don't think these questions uh, have been answered uh, very well. Indeed, we are struggling very hard with these questions. But what I want to say is nothing new. As I said, I echo very much what Mary mentioned earlier, but just quickly, uh, although very substantial quotes here, of Du Weiming, the Harvard-based university, uh, Harvard, sorry, Harvard-based university professor. And he said the East Asia, in particular China, but also including Japan and Korea, these uh, and, and other societies, uh, other parts of China, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, these places. And East Asia has learned the ways very, very hard. That's one. Two, they have learned very, very well in terms of many things. And they have developed a society, which is the, the, almost the only, uh, put the West aside, which is original, you know, the modernization. The East Asia has been the most powerful, most successful among all other non-Western um, regions, most successful in terms of modernization, industrialization. But they have learned the West, often at the expense of their own traditions. They put their traditions aside. This is said by Du Weiming, and I very much agree. And I want to use Chinese, China's experience, particularly in higher education, to illustrate this. So I, I said that the specter is still there, haunting us, the Chinese society. And this question has never been really answered. The integration between the, the East and West has never been truly achieved or achieved well. Mm, it's, it, it, with globalization, it becomes even more selling issue, you know, prominent issue there. Um, so just quickly to explain the Chinese situation, the, uh, like any part of the world, particularly in many other non-Western societies, formal education is Western. Formal education is Western in China. And formal education is a wasting everywhere in the world in terms of content, in terms of organization, in, in terms of concepts. So, um, and, and that formal institutionalized system does not allow non-Western societies, and China is a good example, uh, to, does not provide much room for waste for traditions to, to to be in place, you know, um, and indeed, very often traditions are put aside, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the as a product, you know, our graduates from our modern schools and universities, they actually know very little about their traditions. In China's case, even worse, because since nine, early 20th century, 1919, the system has changed into entirely Western. Um, um, Chinese people today, university graduates, particularly those from major universities, they can communicate easily in English with, with, uh, with foreigners. They can hardly communicate with their Asian sages like Confucius and Mencius. Extremely difficult. Not only difficult for them, not blaming them because of the system. Even for myself as a professor, I feel difficult. So it's, it's not always a 
the, the tool to say Chinese culture has been continuous. It's a question, actually. Whether or not it can continue is a question. Um, and, and how well to continue to carry forward. So just give a few examples, just quickly. The, the formal ideology um, is Marxism. And Marxism, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, I just cite it as an example. You know, uh, the, 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 the ideology is a Marxism, which is from the West, not little to do with Confucius and Moses and other uh, Buddhism or Taoism. And uh, it's not a new issue. Even in the, in the early 20th century, the uh, prominent Chinese scholars say this clearly, openly. If you want to study literature, Chinese literature, you have to understand Western, you know, world. When they say world or foreign, that actually means like, to a great extent Western. And I often ask my students, you know, if you want to study comparative education in Columbia University or UCL, whether or not you need to understand Chinese education. I, um, um, I mean, for, for a Western, for American or British student, um, I don't think that's the case, but for that's certainly the case in China. If you want to study uh, literature, you have to understand Chinese literature. You have to study the Western. And uh, another person is Liang Sumi, said in 1920, uh, if you understand your own society, you have to study, uh, understand the Western world. Otherwise, you just cannot understand your own society. I also want to emphasize, this is important, you know, you see important for the entire uh, intellectual mind in China. The entire intellectual mind in China, I think, is Western. And, and, but I don't mean um, necessarily to be a captive mind, but to a great extent, often it is a captive mind too. Um, that has huge impact on the, today's uh, modern Chinese people, educated people. What is wrong, what is right, what is good and what is bad. You relationships between you and yourself, you and the society, you and nature, all judged to a great extent by Western theories and ideologies. Um, this itself is not necessarily a bad thing, it's a historical fact. But what I think for many Chinese people, um, what is needed is to have integration with the, the tradition. Otherwise, they cannot feel truly happy or settled in their own society. But that kind of integration between Western and Eastern values often taken for granted. Um, uh, Marika mentioned several times, you know, taken for granted. And that often taken for granted too easily. But I just want to cite Dui again to say this is a very difficult. I remember, I, you know, I always remember clearly what Ruth uh, uh, says in, his, in her publications, uh, more, more than once, you know, she emphasized the integration between Chinese idea and Western ideas of a university is extremely difficult. She actually said extremely difficult, if not impossible. So it is difficult. I'm, I emphasize the difficulty, but I don't, I don't think it's not achievable, but we need to take it seriously. We need to know how difficult it is. Um, even for the best minds in the Chinese in, in China, for example, Wang Guowi. I think if you are if you know uh, China, uh, particularly uh, intellectual history, you would know Wang Guowi. He's uh, extremely talented uh, leading scholar in the early twentieth century, and he says this, and I think it's typical. Um, what he loves, he does not believe. What he believes in, he does not love. That's a big issue for Chinese intellectuals today still. Um, see, so they are very painful, painful spirit, spiritually. Um, um, to some extent, the better you are as a scholar, the more painful you are. Only a few people can achieve that top, um, like, uh, like Chen Zhongshu. Most people, even Wang Guowei, he feels that cannot pain very, very hard. He committed suicide to a great extent because of this. Um, what higher education aims to do is to train people who can navigate between East and West. Um, that's extremely difficult, but that's, I think, for our contemporary higher education, we have to. But of course, I want to say the integration at different levels. 
for Chen Zhongshu, that's a high level. But for many professionals, it's just within their own professional fields, it's easier to get there. It's much easier to get there, um, but still very, very difficult. And I just want to emphasize, I'm aware of the time, so I just quickly emphasize, it has long been the, the aim of higher education. Even when Chen Mu created a New Asia Institute uh, College, New Asia College, which later became part of Chinese University of Hong Kong. And, and this has been the uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong's mission um, to combine tradition with uh, modernity and to bring together China and the West. Uh, this was coined about 70 years ago. I do not think our university, including the Chinese University of Hong Kong, is moving closer to the goal. I think it, if not moving backward, I would be good enough to describe the current situation. However, I also want to emphasize during um, Republican era, for example, many, West, many universities, state-run universities, private universities, and missionary universities actually have achieved quite highly in terms of integration between East and West. Therefore, we actually have much to learn from our own history as Chinese. I want to stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks, um, Ray. And, and that was uh, really, really helpful too, I think, in opening up a whole lot of issues. Let me encourage um, everyone now to come forward uh, with your contributions to the Q&A and signal that you want to speak by putting something into the chat. Otherwise, I won't be able to call you in. Uh, let me start the discussion. Um, very challenging set of issues. The two presentations covered different ground, I think, today, uh, but, um, but of course, were um, equally relevant uh, to the topic. Um, so we have um, such different traditions of, the, of humanism in scholarship in higher education in East and West. Uh, and, and whenever you talk about higher education and knowledge, the state in the contemporary era especially is never very far away and perhaps was always never, never very far away in China back to the Zhao dynasty, which is such a brilliant invention in terms of statecraft. Um, and so the state is very much the sort of elephant in the room here when we're talking about the humanities, which nominally at least are just about knowledge and scholarship, aren't they? But we have different state traditions, East and West. We have um, the Chinese tradition of humanistic scholarship inside the state, you know, with the um, with with the with the work of the sages, the poetry, the calligraphy, the painting, all these aesthetic and scholarly achievements being replicated continually by generations of scholar officials who take that sensibility into statecraft. In some respects, it must influence what they do. The tradition that we work to in the humanities in the West is the building tradition, I think. Um, the, the great um, achievement of German um, philosophy in education, uh, which of course so much influenced Dewey and, and the American pragmatists as well. Um, the, these notions that uh, what we are forming in higher education is um, citizens for independent action in civil society. If they may, uh, be uh, um, agents of the state under some circumstances, like Humboldt was when he stood up the university in the early 19th century, but they also may be critics as well. And um, the assumption that, that Kant had in relation to enlightenment was you should make your own decisions. We Education should form people that are able to, um, to operate autonomously uh, and not be directed or, or, or sheep or followers of the state. So you have this notion of of the humanistic intellectualism working to develop civil society and perhaps the market and perhaps the state as well. So one tradition very much embedded in the state, the other ones a foot outside the state and a foot inside the state, but with the foot outside the state is the one which we tend to notice. Um, now, different traditions uh, and in, in their way, both problematic for the humanities. I mean, the state always threatens in the modern era, especially to overbear the content of the humanities to shape what can and can't be said and thought. 
And in the West, the position of critics outside the state marginalizes the humanities, always means they're fighting to establish their credibility, their place as legitimate players in at the middle of the table. Uh, and, and a lot of the time they're not. So highly problematic, yes, in both cases, but the humanity sensibility is everywhere. Look around us, look at the people who lead so many social sectors shaped by their education in history, literature, philosophy, and the other human humanistic disciplines. The social sciences are partly humanistic in their sensibility, especially the classic social sciences like political science, um, anthropology, and uh, which some would say is a humanity, not a social science. Uh, you know, the humanities are, are, are pervasive in their influence on our culture, shape our social language, dominate our media, our imagining. They're still there. In some ways, they're very important still. So this is the paradox, you know, always in battle, threatened, controlled or threatening to be controlled, marginalised and so on, not, not with the standing of the sciences, and yet so pervasive culturally. My question for you, and I'm not sure what the answer is to that paradox, but my question for you is, the tradition is difficult to sustain vis-a-vis -vis the state in this era, I think, despite what I've said about it being pervasive. Can humanists in these different traditions humanities inside the state in the in China and Chinese civilization, humanities largely outside the state in the West, can they can they work together to further the survival of scholarship and scholarly communities? So in the absence of any further questions in the chat, that is the question before you. So can I ask you to talk about cooperation? You know, can we help each other survive and flourish? Marek, you want to go first? <clears throat> yeah, why not? Well, can they work together? I would say the simple answer is yes, if they agree on what plurality is and how it can be handled. And I would say that requires um, mutual understanding of different perspectives, but an agreement, certain agreement on method, um, which is not an, an easy thing in the humanities at the moment, um, or perhaps never. Um, but 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 there is, and I mean, there are different traditions, of course, comparative ways of work, global approach, etc. And I think we sh these are precious, both precious uh, elements shouldn't be lost. Um, and they are under pressure, as I said, the, the different um, trends, the renationalization of of curricula affects the humanities most, as Simon also underlined. Um, from within, and and also trends trends in in the, the decolonization and the review of of certain periods in history. I mean, we're witnessing that here in the in Europe, and in particular in my country, which is still fully busy, not completed the digestion of its colonial history. I can tell you that. So that affects. Uh, these uh, conversations. Um, but I was also thinking when you were talking um, about Europe, um, when I was at school and studied, um, I think we were brought up in a very um, pluralistic European context, learned three foreign languages, English, German, French. Um, and not so long after a war, I was born 15 years only after the end of the Second World War, um, in which, uh, or through, from which we don't know Germany so much uh, in the Humboldtian liberal uh, tradition, <laughs> but also France. I mean, that was basically the country that made a kingdom eventually out of, out of the Netherlands. The French king was our first king. So, 
So, you know, I mean, um, also, also rather contemporary history can feed into a richness of um, um, cultural traditions, languages. I didn't hear much about language. Um, I'm, a, I'm a strong fan of multilingualism. <laughs> from early, early, early age on, I think it's the, it's the personal instrument to actually um, being able to venture as an, as an individual um, and later on perhaps as an intellectual into another culture. It, it's something in the brain almost, uh, as much as in the mind and the body to be able to share and to indulge in another culture. So I, I think we've probably not said enough about the role of higher education in stimulating foreign languages. Um, and of course, uh, Simon, you're right. I mean, um, the state has always been there. Uh, you mentioned Germany, um, talk about China. For Europe, of course, it has been France as well. I mean, uh, uh, um, a very, na Napoleon, a very national state-oriented approach to, to education, notwithstanding, um, of course, the fraternité, liberté, uh, and égalité, and the whole tradition of enlightenment and humanism. So I think these things go together it's a, in education about equipping individuals to, to indulge, to to, um, to bridge them and to, to benefit from more worlds than your own nation. Simon, I see uh, more questions raised um, in the chat room. But I just quickly um, respond to your question, Simon. Um, the short answer is, of course, yes. Uh, otherwise, we don't, we as academic, we don't have much value there. But um, I think uh, it's well based to answer the question positively. Um, but I just want to emph emphasize humanities are important, but the way we do humanities, we need to reconsider very seriously at this age. And I just want to say, I also uh, try to answer some questions raised in the chat room. Um, citing China as example, I think non Western. Uh, intellectual traditions need to show, to prove their value. Um, and, and, and particularly, well, if possible, empirically also, you know, empirical evidences are needed to show uh, non-Western intellectual tradition can make a difference, can, can contribute to the dialogue so that we will have a better world. And particularly empirical evidence. I, I do have a few students looking at this kind of issue um, as a Chinese uh, thought as a global resource resources. Um, but I also want to emphasize because I just got a response from uh, Aki. I say Aki is here. And I want to say, if you look at China, there are different kinds of scholars in higher education, for example. Uh, we do have very Chinese people working only within the system. And some of them are wonderful actually as good as those international scholars I know in the global uh, arena, but, um, but they are little known. They are Chinese, they're working in China, in Chinese. And there are people uh, working in the West, uh, looking at China. Um, and there's people like me to some extent, I'm in the middle, go between. I actually think people like me, um, we, we are in a very difficult situation because you, if you really want to excel, you need to work within one system or one discourse. If you try to cross these discourses, it's extremely difficult. You double your workload. Um, but I think these kind of people are very much needed. And I think Aki is a typical example. I remember um, um, Simon mentioned that very many years ago, say we relied people like Aki to understand the Japanese higher education system. Um, um, so these people are very much needed. Um, but we need to go further, Aki and I, for example, we need to go further to show how intellectually, uh, epistemologically, as Marie mentioned earlier, 
we can contribute to the debate. Thank you. I see another question in the uh, chat. Uh, I'll, I'll bring them in. Um, thanks both. Um, and I think we'll bring Aki in in a minute uh, too, yep. really, but I've, I have promised James Robson who came in first the next spot on the call list. Mm -hmm. So, and then I'll, we'll invite Aki to come in because his contribution is not yeah. exhausted, I think. Um, James. Thanks, Simon, and thank you for two really fantastic presentations. I think they were yeah, really, really enjoyable and um, really yeah, challenged us to think about uh, about these differences across uh, across the world. My question is um, is perhaps much more technical uh, than philosophically oriented, um, but I really appreciated the call and the challenge to C.P. Snow's sort of false dichotomy. Um, and and yeah, I think we need to. To keep emphasizing that it's uh, it's important not to get sucked into these sort of quite divisive debates and so the call for intellectual pluralism and interdisciplinarity is very welcome i think and is clearly a uh, an important way forward in framing higher education and the uh, the offers that it can make to society but i wonder if that's in tension with broader regulatory frameworks that are embedded in policy. I'm talking about sort of research assessment. I'm talking about different ways of structuring, um, yeah, sort of how we measure outcomes and so on and so forth, where they're inherent within policy frameworks is a drive towards putting up boundaries between disciplines, which ultimately you know, means that those disciplines suffer but what can we do about that? How can we overcome those sort of pressures from above? You can self-select on the answer. Who wants to go first? Well, let me respond just briefly. I, I, I don't have an answer, James. Um, and I'm not particularly optimistic. Um, because as Dean, I'm struggling all, all the time, all the time. And, uh, but because we are in Hong Kong, our, our research assessment, James, you mentioned particularly research assessment and policy, how to assess values of the faculty, of the work, and also the individual publications uh, not working well for these beautiful ideas like intellectual pluralism, uh, not at all supportive, uh, almost the opposite. So that's why I'm saying I'm not particularly optimistic at the moment. Personally, although I've been trying desperately to achieve what I want to achieve, yeah, but with great difficulty. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm worried, I'm concerned there, um, because yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, um, there, first of all, internal organization of universities, and I think there's another comment in the, in the in the chat about that yeah i mean disciplinary orientation is almost inbuilt in still in still a lot of universities in their organizational structure that doesn't help uh, because it you know it drives socialization processes into um uh in in that sense um but it's in terms of external regulatory frameworks and uh things like accreditation i would say that is stronger in education than in research. I think in research universities are far more autonomous um, than in, in education. Um, and if you look at um, successful initiatives within or across universities to overcome disciplinary boundaries, I think we find them more easily and more frequently in research than in education. And there's a lot that holds us back in education uh, in terms of ex external regulation that may come from accreditation um, from governments, but also from the professions. Professional accreditation may also be, despite all the talk about interdisciplinarity in 21st century, this and that, may be quite uh, stifling in, in traditional. Um, but um, if you look deeper at where interdisciplinary approaches are successful, as initiated from within universities or across universities, you find more scale, <laughs> more scope, but also I think more uh, often success in the 
sciences, health, engineering side of the spectrum than in the humanities. And that is very, very regrettable. Um, and I'm very concerned about that. And with the trends I, I listed, which are not all uh, without critique and, 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 um, yeah, and concern, what I fear is that the dichotomy, um, yes, that's no, uh, talked about is actually at stake um, and widening. It's a widening gap again within universities. And that's that's the danger at this point, I think, in universities and the challenge for the leadership to, to bring it together and to bridge it and to in integrate. And that's more difficult. That's the other chat question than um, achieving internationalization, for instance, or Eastern, Western, or North, South perspectives. I mean, in my country, 40% on average, on average, 40% of the faculty is international. That's, you know, way more um, easy to change than these structures uh, that are uh, institutionalized and rigid. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the epistemic <laughs> assumption of a discipline as opposed to a broader approach to knowledge is that you know, you have a bounded set of knowledge, which the conceit is that that prism or that lens is enough for you to understand everything you need to know. So that's what, although it sounds preposterous when you put it like that, but that's what a discipline essentially teaches students. This is enough. You know, if you're learning economics, an economic view of the world will be sufficient. If you're learning psychology, that will provide you with what you really need to know and everything else is marginal to that and so on and so on through the disciplines so if that's the case then it's very difficult for people to start adopting more than one cultural lens which is a bigger jump than going from economics to psychology yeah, but of course um, when they do do that as as Rui does it's tremendously important uh and and influential and um you know, it's 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 a it's a, if I could use the word advisedly, it's a powerful move intellectually, I think, to bring in more than one culture properly, and start to understand things through more than one lens. Let me bring in our next two questioners together to make sure that they both come in and also that they both get answered. So, Aki, would you like to add anything further to what's already been said in the chat? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, the thank you both for the very insightful this uh, the presentation and uh, I really learned a lot uh, from your discussion. And the my uh, I think that Ryan Rui already uh, answered halfway, but the the modernization or the Shandai Fa in a uh, the Chinese con uh, the term it is highly frequently used in a even in a kind of contemporary dialogue in the Chinese higher education research and policy discipline debate. And then the, my impression is that, that this idea of the modernization is not exactly the same with the so-called westernization or the, the integration with the West. So the, I think that the, the, there are some uh, the overlapping, but the, maybe the, the East uh, world Especially for those who are not really, you know, as already mentioned, that uh, who are living in a kind of more domestic, close uh, society, tend to uh, pursue more like uh, their own way of the understanding of modernization, and that and so that, that that is what I want to ask you to uh, confirm or the your uh, to hear your view on this issue. Yeah. Before you answer, let me bring in. Hui Yuan uh, Ye, who's, I think, going to return to the disciplines and culture problem. Right. Thank you so much for the two presenters for the wonderful presentations. My name is Hui Yuan Ye from Duke Quinshan University, which is a small liberal arts and sciences university in, in China, mainland China, and it's actually very new. And uh, so our university uh, tries to uh, promote two things at the same time. One is interdisciplinarity, and on the other hand, hand is interculturalism. And sometimes we feel that uh, there, there is synergy between these two, but on the other hand, there are also 
uh, obstacle is trying to put them together. So I want to see uh, if there are any examples or success stories or best practices in, in terms of these to bring these two integrations together. And I also want to hear something about if there is any thoughts about tenure, faculty tenure review or structure as a way to, you know, kind of to promote uh, these kind of thinking. Thank you. There's two questions. I'll leave it to you to again to decide who would like to go first. Rui, you're closer right. to the microphone, so you go first. Okay, um, I would. I, I wanted to ask Mary to go first. Okay, um, that's a difficult question um, and quite difficult to explain. Very, but just try to be briefly. Uh, it's quite difficult to explain. Um, uh, okay, I think you already know the answer. Um, but just want, as you said, you just want confirmation from me. I just want to say modernization is defined uh, differently during different historical periods in, Ch in China, and also differently by different people, even within the same uh, historical period. Um, for long, China has been catching up um, and in order to catch up. So even re rhetorically, they say, oh, okay, modernization does not mean westernization, but by ancients, it is. It is uh, westernization largely. To a great extent, uh, it is westernization. And that's the past. And when China is uh, economically and militarily strong enough, um, understandably they emphasize modernization does not mean westernization. But that another danger is there. And based on, of course, China's interaction with other major powers in the world, and that at the moment does not look you know, so, so, so rosy. And, and so that can in, have huge impact on um, how the Chinese elite respond and that, yeah, theoretically, of course, we want to see integration between the two. Of course, Chinese modernization shouldn't be a westernization, um, but that has rarely been achieved, rarely been achieved. That's why I say Chinese tradition has been in danger. Um, and to answer, to some extent, to answer Hui Yuan's question, um, I really want to, we can communicate more in the future. I really want to say, for example, successful experience Mingguo Re Republic era, some university really achieved very highly in terms of integration between Chinese and Western. And more specifically, uh, Lianda, Xinan Lianda, uh, also achieved very highly, uh, particularly in, 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 in humanities and social sciences. That's a good example. In terms of regions, actually Hong Kong education, Hong Kong education differs very much from that in China, in the mainland and from that in Taiwan. Hong Kong education has better integration between East and West by accident other than by design. And I personally, as Dean of Education, I'm particularly keen to theorize Hong Kong education, both at school level and also at university level. That's why I, I, I try to interpret our higher education from a bicultural perspective, a perspective which is badly needed, but rarely achieved in the West. Um, and to some extent, not, also very rarely in mainland China, but very popular, very, um, very much in Hong Kong. That's something we need to notice. Thank you. Well, I'll be very brief because it's almost time. Um, I think it helps enormously uh, to work across cultures, um, regions, and disciplines. Um, if you have, uh, if you have the tools and the, the, um, the skills. Um, and of course the sciences have um, a very great advantage in having a universal language. And I'm not referring to English, I'm referring to mathematics. And of course they um, benefit, uh, generate benefit, generate benefit enormously of everything that they do. Um, we can learn from that. <laughs> because the digitalization, you know, is at our disposal. This is, it was not a joke that I ended with the, the chat GPT, um, because that will affect humanities and our, our craft as well. But um, so we have to think about uh, these tools. And, and I was thinking then to the disciplines, it's, uh, yeah, it is a matter of learning different languages. Um, but for instance, for language learning and cultures, we have exchange programs. They've been hugely uh, popular in Europe, notably, that's where. 
why perhaps we should organize exchange programs across the disciplines. Well, thank you both. I mean, I think that was really good discussion, but we only just scratched the surface, didn't we? There was many themes and that we that we weren't, could have taken further if we had more time and you know your contributions on those themes are really appreciated and also those of our questioners as well uh and um i must uh i think take heart from Rui's point that hong kong is is a good place for the for understanding the um hybridity and multiplicity of cultures what what can be achieved when they're brought together um my feeling is that in the long term, it's going to be our capacity to to um, put cultures together successfully that will determine the future of the world in many ways. And already in East Asia, we see that sensibility, that capacity to work with more than one voice, more than one philosophical tradition, more than one um, way of thinking uh, simultaneously as very well developed in the modern East Asian University. And I guess the um, the hope is that the indigenous part will flourish in future as well as the westernized part. And Ruiz alerted us to the danger of westernization swamping everything. But of course, the other danger which we have in the West is that we're still not taking seriously the uh, bicultural and multicultural character of the world. And we've got a lot to learn still in in developing that in our universities but perhaps the humanities are one of the places that it's most likely to move forward on that important that vital project so we need the humanities and we need the arts and our next and final discussion of the humanities and the arts will be from Leonard Ching uh, and uh, Mickey McDonald on Thursday that'll be the sixth and final webinar in our series uh, which has been very successful. 60 people tuned in today. Thank you for your contribution. And most of all, thanks to our wonderful speakers. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.